Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of this show. Every week I get to talk to interesting CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of companies and organizations ranging from Netflix to YPO, EO, Activation, Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table, many more. Go check out the archives. We've got some great episodes in there. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And before introducing today's guest, I want to give a big shout out to Double Dare Executive Coaching and Scott Anderson made this series possible. If you're looking for an experienced executive coach who has been in the trenches as an entrepreneur to help you break through a business plateau, Scott Anderson and Double Dare Executive Coaching offer a proven system to scale your life personally and professionally. He has 30 plus years of experience as a proven entrepreneur, started over a half dozen companies, also has a master's degree in clinical counseling. Check out doubledareu.us for a quick online assessment and schedule a free business blueprint from Scott. That's double dare, Y-O-U dot U-S. D visit double dare today. All right. And my guest is DJ Rezak. He is the owner of Time for Two Coaching. He'll explain what that means in a moment. And also KB Building Services, which provides commercial janitorial services along with carpet cleaning and hard floor maintenance in the Omaha, Nebraska area through Time for Two Coaching. He provides programs to help business leaders and families and dads and athletic groups with motivation and tools to grow their businesses and to excel in life. He's also been a member of EO Entrepreneurs Organization for 20 plus years, and he has been married to Lisa Marante Rezac, and together they live and are raising five kids in Omaha, Nebraska. So we're gonna talk about that. This episode, of course, is brought to you by Rise25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You Podcasts and content marketing. Learn more by going to rise 25 Media dot com or emailing us at support at rise25media.com. All right, DJ, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. And I'm glad that Scott uh, told us uh, all about you. You've got a couple of different businesses that are really interesting. And let's start with um, your mom and your aunt started a family business, 1984, which you end up purchasing from them. Um, and tell us a little bit about how you ended up going to the family business. Did you do it right after college? Were you, you know, oftentimes you hear this story from people that say that, oh, I didn't want to go, I don't want to go in the family business. And then somehow they end up back into it anyways. How did right. you end up in the family business? Yeah, well, first, yeah, thanks, John, for having me on. But yeah, you're exactly right. So I'm growing up, I'm a teenager and I'm part of the forced labor crew, right? <laughs> um, so what are you doing on Friday night? Usually met, you're going to have a vacuum in your hand. So, oh, man. So you're cleaning offices. Yeah. So I'm cleaning buildings, right? Oh, man. Uh, you know, a real sexy job for a high school sophomore. Um, yeah. But um, I did not go in right away. So um, my dad had owned bars and restaurants and my mom um, and my aunt had started the janitorial company. So the cool part is I was around entrepreneurial uh, spirit the whole time. So I graduate from college and I open up a pizza place, right? Mm -hmm. And the only thing I knew about pizza was how to eat it and how to order it. And <laughs> so I, I hit the ground running in Lincoln, Nebraska with the pizza place and, and kind of navigate and find my way through a lot of times by just because I'd watch my dad in his business and my mom and my aunt in their business uh, with their stick to -itiveness. And that's, I think, what a lot of entrepreneurs just need in the beginning is just the grit to just grind through those tough, those moments. And so... So I did that on my own for about 10 years. I ended up, you know, expanding the pizza place to owning two or three more bars and kind of doing my own thing. And then uh, when I sold them, I was looking for another business to buy. And at that time, my mom and my aunt were kind of looking after about 20 years for an exit strategy. And so uh, that's when it kind of just you know, became clear, like, Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm moving back to Omaha. It, it might be an opportunity to buy a business at that time. It was kind of 25 employees, about 1 million in rev. And, uh, you know, like I told my wife, Lisa, I'm like, I, I, 
I used to cook and now I'm going to clean. It, like, isn't that every woman's dream? Right. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's how it ended up. So I ended up buying it from them in about 2003. Now, the timing wasn't great or shortly thereafter, it wasn't great because you lost a key client um, and you also had, I don't know if you describe it as a sweetheart deal with your, your mom and your aunt, but they, they kind of had a good deal. So talk a little bit about what that experience was like. Yeah. So Lisa and I um, had just um, had a set of twins. So Dominic and Caroline, we had fraternal twins. We had just purchased the janitorial company. and um, soon after, six months after I bought it, uh, we got fired from our biggest account. And so again, we were doing about a million in rev. This was going to cost us about a half a million. Wow. And, so 50% uh, of your business gone 50 overnight. 50% percent of my business was gone overnight. And it was due to an error that we made and that we found. And, you know, we went to them and said, we screwed up and begged for mercy. And, and uh, we didn't really get any. And it was a cold, hard truth in like how cutting business could be and how scary it could be. Um, and so it was kind of a, a big punch in the gut. And as an entrepreneur, um, you know, I was struggling, right? And, you know, that, that voice inside your head that says, do you have what it takes? Yeah. And, you know, this was a big punch that said, no. You, you uh, although really you'd don't. been a pretty seasoned entrepreneur by this point, you'd, you'd yeah. run your restaurants, you'd expanded it, you know? Yeah, but I think also um, you're always kind of your own worst critic, I think, when you're an entrepreneur. And so all of a sudden you're looking at the balance sheet and you're, you're watching the P&L and it's, you're losing $15,000 a month. And, um, and then, you know, I got a set of twins at home. And thankfully, Lisa, who was a, a CFO of a, in, an IREIT, you know, was bringing home a good income. Uh, but as fate would have it, like, I, the, you know, that wasn't enough for me to like, you know, make a move and really get going. Um, we got pregnant again. What, with, what did you do to survive the loss of the big uh, client? Did you have to do layoffs? Did you? Um, did you do? No. Well, we um, I still have a pair of my wingtips. I have holes in the bottom, bottom of them. I just <laughs> walked. I just knocked on everybody's door. I just I mean, I was I just sold, sold, sold. Hmm. Um, but that moment didn't come until after, you know, for a lot of times I just ran and hid. I just, you know, I didn't really deal with it. Hmm. Um, I didn't deal with it until we got pregnant again with the second set of twins. And so that, that was the second blow, right? Lisa said, Hey, I'm pregnant again. And wow. it's twins again. And this time, um, she followed it up with, and by the way, I'm quitting my job, which <laughs> paid about $10,000 a month. So um, so while I had kind of, you know, just moved the chess pieces along and kind of did what a lot of entrepreneurs I run into, they kind of pretend or tell the lie that they're, you know, they're, they're trading um, activity for productivity, right? They're mm -hmm. just looking busy. Um, I had to do something about it. And so what I did is I just started walking door to door. And I, it was literally because I was scared and I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And so we were lucky. We, we ended up um, kind of getting an account. Um, we started cleaning movie theaters. I don't know if you know this, John, but um, I didn't know it at the time, but movie theaters pay weekly, which was Good. incredible for our yeah. cash flow. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I told this movie theater, I said, I'll do such a good job. After I do a good job on your first movie theater, I need you to give us more. And that eventually led them to giving us four movie theaters. Wow. And so it was through hard work and, wow. and really building a good team that could, that could get the job done that made that pivot point. You were active in EO at the time. You had a forum that you meet with regularly. Do you recall what role they played in this period of time and helping you through it? Oh, huge. It was huge. And in fact, those brothers are still my brothers today. Um, they were the ones that I was, you know, bringing kind of my brokenness to and, and my doubt of, I don't know if I have what it takes. And uh, anyone that's not familiar with EO, there's, you don't give advice, you just share experiences. But those were the guys that kind of, um, you know, were willing to say, you can let go of the rope, we'll catch you. You know, um, you can, you can, you can do whatever it takes. And we believe in you. And 
um, I think it was the power of six other men who believed in me, even when I didn't, that kind of gave me the strength and the courage. And then they're also sharing their success and their failures. And that was big. It was big to know that I wasn't alone. I wasn't mm-hmm. the only one that was, you know, having some struggles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, flash forward a little bit. Um, 08, 09. Um, we all know what happened with the economy, global meltdown, real estate meltdown. Um, you're servicing, I think, a lot of commercial properties in this period of time. And you also are coming in as president of your chapter at the time um, when your business goes through some struggles. So take us back to that period of time and what that was like. Yeah, uh, it was that again, I think was very scary. And if we look back, that's when we grew the most in our janitorial company, you know, when all during that uh, downturn. Yeah, during that downtime. And I think it was directly related to me leading at EO, because that's when I got really familiar with strategic planning, strategic leadership. And when you actually have an intentional outcome, and then you kind of can reverse engineer it or build it backwards and then have um, accountable um, people at, or have meeting rhythms and accountability around it, uh, you can actually get stuff done, even in a recession. And the, the greatest thing for me as a leader, John, was um, when I started figuring out how to lead leaders like these other entrepreneurs at EO. And, I, you know, I like EO. I like my chapter. Um, but I thought, why aren't I doing this in my business? Why, why, aren't, why aren't I, if I'm doing this at the chapter level and learning this, this will work in my business. Because I like EO, but I really like my company. And then furthermore, once, once that led me to, oh my gosh, this works in not only EO, but also my company. I really love the people that I live with in my house. How can I figure out how to do this coaching in my house? Yeah. And so that led to my time for two coaching. What was the secret sauce, um, you know, leading a bunch of entrepreneurs who all have their own separate businesses? How do you get them all marching in the same direction? What was it, do you think, got them Uh, all? You you know, I would say there's, there's kind of three things. One is your character, right? If you have people who believe in the same values that you do, you know, that's, that's number one. The second thing I think as the leader was um, I had to share, I had to show competence. And what I tell every leader today, anywhere, any coach, competence, all competence means is can you help me get my job done? Can you help me? Can you tell me how to do it better, faster, smarter, easier? Can you tell me where the roadblocks are? And then the final piece is connection. Not every human being is the same, right? And so connection, meeting people where they 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 were was super important in learning that leadership style because the way I used to do it, like in my company, you had to do it or else you got fired. <laughs> I couldn't fire any other EOers. Right. So I had to really adjust accordingly and kind of meet them where they needed to, to build connection. Now, you also joined the global board and different volunteer capacities through this organization. This is- to someone who's listening to this and thinking like, I got enough uh, you know, on my plate running my business, how can I also, and why should I also serve in a volunteer capacity? How can I possibly um, make the time for something like that? And why would it benefit me? What's your response to that? Yeah, it made me better. It made me a hundred times better. The connection to experts, the, the thirst for learning, the sharing, um, the other uh, peers, peer-to-peer learning was huge. Like talking to someone who had been at 10 million before I had been at 10 million was, you know, life giving, you know, having them share, this is what I learned. This is what I would have done different. Um, and because I spent that time investing in thirst for learning, I brought it all back. And, and in fact, I would try and include my uh, KB executive team in any learning event at EO locally, I could because it was one thing for me to go off to the hills and bring back the lessons. But when they actually got to go and interact and mix and see uh, see this really working in the real world, it was powerful. And so it's um, I think it's an abundance thing. 
I think, um, you know, when I get scarcity and when I pull back, uh, that's when things get hard. But when I open myself up to what's possible and then I actually go after it and learn from it and then share, that's, that's what made it work for me. Yeah. You continue to own KB today, but you started to move out of it around 2013, 2014. What was the secret to being able to move out of it? I imagine some of the things you already mentioned, but is there anything else that enabled you to be able to continue to own the company, monitor it, monitor its performance, and have it continue to operate without you? Yeah, let, letting people fail. Um, it sounds so crazy, but letting our great, hiring really good people, great culture fits, and then um, coaching and cheerleading them up, and then letting them fail like not interfering with the process, um, teaching the lesson, and then helping them recognize that failure wasn't fatal um, was huge because they would then take ownership of it. And they, I, I still believe, you know, our president, Channing Johnson, uh, she's been with me since 07 or 08. Um, I say all the time, people would call me and say, wait, you need to make this decision. This is a really big decision. This is like a $10,000 decision. And I'd say, she's fine. She can make it. And they'd say, well, what if she screws it up? And I would say, I'm guessing if she screws it up, she'll figure out how to make 20,000 on the next deal. Mm. And that's exactly what happened, John, was mm. the empowerment that came from letting them fail instead of me knocking them out of the way you know, being the hero that says, this is how we did it in the past. Look at how good I can do it. I can make this work here or here or here. Um, really gave us, gave me the ability to not be there. Mm. I'm curious from a, a metric or a KPI standpoint, um, how do you as an owner um, monitor the, the progress of the company? Do you get weekly reports, monthly reports? Is it once a year? Are you talking to Channing uh, on a weekly basis. What, yeah. What's your involvement now? So I, I meet with Channing once a week and it's always at her discretion, whatever she wants to bounce off of me. Um, I monthly, I get four numbers, um, see behind the numbers, Greg Crabtree. Um, I, you know, I can't even remember the. I'm, I'm such a poor uh, accounting guy, uh, but you know, it's cost of goods sold and SG&A and labor and then uh, net income. And I literally have those four numbers that I look at and we, she blows them away all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have a, I have a great cost accountant who is on our team and, you know, that I, I just trust and build that trust. And, um, and I think they feel empowered because that's, and, and they also feel though, you know, by meeting once a week, you know, Channing will say, hey, I, I do need your clout here, right? I, I need you to call this guy and tell him X, Y, or Z. Very rarely, but she'll just say, I'm just getting stuck. You know, you have the connection, you're the owner, uh, yeah. help bridge that gap. But that's, that's once in a blue moon. Or she'll say, I'm really struggling with this internal issue. And we'll coach through it. And, you know, that's really my involvement is once a week. But uh, my job is to cheerlead and coach and just, you know, celebrate. And that, that's really the fun part. So, right. Right. And, and that's actually what inspired time for two coaching, which first of all, time for two coaching, why'd you call it that? Yeah. So I would, so when I would go through and meet um, entrepreneurs and I would coach um, a lot of times I would hear entrepreneurs be like, and they would be killing it. They'd be killing it at work, you know, making $3 million and, and, they, then they would say, well, this is what my family needs me to do or wants me to do or whatever. I can't, I don't have time to be a state. I don't have time to be a great dad. I need to make the money or vice versa. I would run into families who would say, well, I'm not really going to go after it very much at work because I want to be here for my kids. And what I had recognized is when you get your priorities aligned and you get true intention, you can actually have time for two. You can kill it at work but you can also kill it at home. And so that was the inspiration for time for two. Um, and you know what? I fell down a lot 
um, as I started that at first too, right? We well, it's wrote a very to- different business model, right? I mean, you, you oh. know, talk a little bit about that, you know, going from pizza and bars to, you know, commercial cleaning to coaching model. Yeah. Well, and it's, um, I, I would say each one um, is different, um, but they all involve the same thing, people, right? And you go back to that EO connection, like what I learned is really, um, really people just want connection. And, and so I, in coaching, what I found out is people want to be heard, people want to be seen, and people want to know that what they told you matters to you somehow, some way, right? I mean, so the validation process, I think, is huge in coaching. Um, when I started it, I did what most entrepreneurs do. I used the only scoreboard I knew how, which was money, right? The more yeah. money I have, the better yeah. the score is. Yeah. And um, when I started thinking about that and, and you know, I'm providing content, I'm delivering videos, I'm building, you know, weekly stuff that has yeah. to go out. Um, I was becoming less and less um, successful at home because I didn't have time. I was a little bit grumpy. I was a little bit tired, you know, and I was sitting there thinking, I don't need more money, right? Why am I chasing after this? And so as far as the coaching goes, I think the validation part was huge. And and then, uh, you know, everyone wants to be successful. I just had to redefine what did success look like for me. So money is an easy barometer to measure success at work. At home, it's harder. So how do you determine what metrics you use to determine um, whether you're being success, successful as a, as a spouse, as a parent? Yeah, um, I think it's different for everybody. So my, mine is, um, I, I use three, thirst for learning. Am I learning something? Um, am I building relationship? And am I serving others? And so when I, when I chase after those three, John, I know that I have more happiness in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I just do. And when I get it screwed up, I start chasing image and status. You know, it's the, it's the part where I try and act cool or, or act, you know, more important than I should at the party or at the 4th of July, or, you know, I'm trying to impress somebody else by, oh, I worked with this guy, or I, I traveled here to do this. You know, I know that I'm off track there. And Mm -hmm. so for me, my scoreboard is, am I learning something? Am I serving others? And do I build relationship with them? Yeah. And so that, that's really what has been my measurement. Yeah. And um, talk about the Dare to Dad program also and why move into from business leaders, why move into specifically dads? Yeah. So I, I think that time for two was huge. I mean, I think uh, ultimately um, if you're not winning at home, I mean, you know, I don't I don't know if it really matters, you know, at least for me. Um, I, I, like I said, I really like the people I work with, but I love the people that I live with, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to be intentional there and we have such short time together, right? You have, and I, I, I have authority over all my kids, but what I wanted, John was influence. I wanted them to be able to say to me, uh, Hey dad, I'm 17 years old and uh, I'm going to a party and it kind of feels like it would be fun to drink tonight. I wanted them to be able to say that. And then we could say, well, okay, let's talk about it. What's the feeling behind it? What I didn't want them to go underground with those things. I wanted them to be able to bridge the gap. And I think by doing that with dare to dad or, or helping build family playbooks, you build that, you build that influence. And, and that's the beauty um, of any uh, journey, I think, that we go on as entrepreneurs is how, how good do you do in your home? Because you, those are people that, you know, didn't ask to be here. You, you intentionally brought them here. Now, right. let's right. guide them. Right, right. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, kids and entitlement. Um, especially as we, you know, society is becoming more affluent. We're better off today than we were, you know, that we have been for all of human history, basically. And you had a friend who said to you that, you know, your kids were basically born on third base and that kind of shook you a little bit. 
and you had to think about it. Talk about how that, how you reacted to that and what you did about it. Yeah. Well, first I wanted to deflect it. I just didn't want to own that. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but the truth is they were, they were born on third base, you know, um, now their job, my job was to make sure that they didn't think they hit a triple, you know, <laughs> um, we needed to make sure that they knew that, that, you know, that they were very privileged. Um, the number one thing I think we've done to, to, and my kids are normal. They're, they fall down, they fail. I, I told you this earlier, I'm a great dad, except for when I'm not right. The duality of that is true. And, um, sometimes I can be entitled. And what keeps grounding me and coming back to is gratefulness. You know, I think as a dad, most people oscillate between, you know, shame, guilt, anger, fear, you know, that shame. I am a bad dad. Guilt. I did something bad that makes me a bad dad. Anger. I'm going to blame others and complain about my ungrateful kids or fear. I really don't know what to do about having ungrateful kids. And I think the gateway is courage. Do you have the courage to lead your family and talk about gratefulness? Because the truth is, um, when I'm grateful, it's really hard to be entitled. It's super hard for me to be angry. And that, that is a perfect transition. I don't know if you meant it that way, but perfect transition to the last question that I want to ask you, which is about gratitude. I'm a big fan of gratitude as well. Yeah. So if you look around, particularly at peers and contemporaries, however you want to define that, it could be forum mates, could be other entrepreneurs, you know, however you want to define that, who do you respect? Who do you admire that's doing good things out there? Yeah, well, um, the first thing comes to mind is my forum, right? And lots of EO leaders, and that's already been talked about. Um, we were fortunate enough to, to sponsor a baseball team, a high school baseball team. And the head coach uh, has since retired. His name is Bob Greco. He's in the Hall of Fame. He was a national coach of the year. You know, he won 700 games. But Bob was about eight years older than me. And so he had kind of been on the path of leadership and, and ch child raising before me. And so he's someone I'm extremely grateful to because he would pull me aside and share lessons with me all the time and how it related to his team and how it related to his marriage and how it related to his kids. And I was always listening. And in fact, Bob's still one of my best friends today, right? Mm -hmm. He's retired um, and he's still one of my best friends. And, you know, we finished third in the, we finished third in the American Legion World Series and we're sitting in left field and kids are devastated, you know, I mean, uh, you know, so close to winning the championship. And he put it all in great perspective in one sentence. He just said, listen, Tomorrow night, they're going to play for a championship and it's over for them too. All we did is miss it by one day. That's it. You just missed it by one day. That's okay. Be grateful. We had all this time together and that's what you're going to remember. And that has stuck with me, you know, since, since it happened in 2014. And he's, he's one guy that, you know, he, his balance sheet doesn't look like mine. He was a high school teacher, but man, the impact that he's made in my life, huge. DJ, that's such a great story. Thank you. Time for two coaching and dare to dad. Where can people go to check out more about those programs and learn more about you or connect with you? Yeah, dare to dad.com. And I think time for two.org, I think are my two websites. Um, you know, I'm only working with 20 dads a year now just to kind of uh, my schedule. And I think for 2022, I only have like 10 slots left, but it's more one on one. Uh, LinkedIn is a great place to go. Um, I'm there. Um, but yeah, hit me up on the website and yeah, you know, I have some books and some playbooks and I'm happy to share those with anybody and everyone. Awesome. DJ. Thanks so much. Right on. Thanks, John. Thank you for listening to the smart business revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution Podcast. <laughs>